other problem that they had that had built up, and I'm not going to I'm not going to give you every problem. Believe me, there were so many problems. I'm going to give you a flavor of some of the uh, larger ones or the more interesting ones. But another problem they had was their dealer network. So they have dealers all over the United States, and for that matter, all over the world, and they operate under franchise agreements that are governed by state law. And the dealers essentially have permanent licenses to sell those cars. And what happened over the years, and again, some of this is actually not their fault. Some of it is simply the way the industry grew up. But imagine a, a lot of you are in the, the packaging business and involved in consumer goods. So imagine an industry that for many years was a, was a lot of mom and pop operations, that in a, a town you'd have these small dealerships run by some family, and you'd have a lot of them. And that was a business model that actually may well have worked or wasn't at least stupid for a long period of time. But just the way retailing has consolidated into larger entities, so too uh, did the car industry need to consolidate. The newer entrants into the industry, like Toyota and Honda that you see at the top, were not burdened by these franchise agreements. And so they were able to set up dealers in these cities um, with larger footprints, with larger stores, and simply selling more cars per dealer. GM, Ford, and Chrysler, which you see at the bottom of this, of this chart, had this burden. And so they were simply selling fewer cars per dealer. So I've given you one set of statistics at the bottom here, uh, which is that the average Toyota dealer in 2008 sold 1,500 cars. The average GM dealer sold 218 cars. It is really hard to be competitive when you have such a small sales volume. You can't afford the services. You can't afford a beautiful store, and so forth. The, the next problem that I, I, I want to talk about is what we call, in, what actually, if you want to know the industry jargon, I learned this. I didn't know anything about the car industry when I got there. But there's a, there's a, um, a phrase in the car world called cash on the hood. Um, this is what you might see when, if you watch ads where people offer you five years of zero financing, or they offer you a $1,000 immediate rebate if you show up tomorrow, things like that. This is essentially discounting. And it's gone on in the car industry uh, forever. But what happened as you got to 2008 was that it, it increased very, oops, sorry, my button. Uh, it increased very sharply. And so back in 1998, the average discounts for both the Detroit 3 and the transplants were around $1,200. When you got to 2008, they had grown for both groups, but they had grown much faster for what we call the Detroit 3, up to $5,000. Now, why did that happen? It happened for uh, several reasons. There was a recession. There was a need to move cars. And so they started discount. But part of the structural problem in this industry was the fact that labor, I never saw this before in my whole career, but when they gave us financial statements, labor was actually a fixed cost in this industry. Because of the union agreements, the workers got paid whether cars got made or cars didn't get made. So labor was a fixed cost. It wasn't a variable cost. You couldn't change your labor costs when your sales went down. And so with fixed costs being as high as they were, these companies actually had an incentive to keep making cars because they didn't save a lot of money by not making cars. But then they made so many cars that the only way to sell them was to discount them so heavily that they really couldn't make money on them. And so they, again, had this major structural problem of a cost structure that they couldn't manage and that was, uh, was too high and, and, in, and, so, and, in, and so inflexible. And so this slide goes through some of the issues uh, involving the labor situation. The, the, the people who ran uh, GM and Ford and Chrysler weren't stupid. They made a lot of mistakes, and I'm going to talk about some more of them. And, and, and the changes that we made. But they understood the basic nature of this particular problem, that they had these union agreements that made it very difficult for them to operate their business the way you would uh, if you had more flexibility. And so before we showed up in 2009, they had made some progress chipping away at some of the more onerous requirements of the business. But one of the things that we basically said to ourselves is we had to get labor costs in line with their competitors. You can't make money if your labor costs are materially higher than your competitors. And they were. As you can see here, they were paying about $62 per hour. Uh, that includes cash, uh, uh, cash of about half of that amount and then benefits of the other half. And their competitors were paying more in the $44 to $56 per hour level. 
The other thing they had were these incredibly restrictive work pro uh, practices. They had something like 300 different job classifications. So if you were in charge with microphones, you could not touch water. And if you were in charge of slides, you could not touch seating. And so it was an incredibly inefficient way to operate a company where workers could not be moved around or given other jobs to do beyond what they were, uh, what their assigned classification was. And then, of course, they had the famous legacy uh, health care costs. They had essentially promised free health care or close to free health care for life to all their workers when they retired as part of the collective bargaining agreements, as part of their union agreements. Now, again, they had been somewhat successful. Management had been somewhat successful in, uh, in putting a box around those obligations. They essentially got the unions to agree that they would take all those obligations and put them into a separate entity called a VIBA. Think of it as a trust or a pension fund almost. And they would fund that, and that that would limit the company's liability. And so they had made some progress. But for GM, that was a $30 billion number. For Chrysler, it was a $12 billion number in terms of what they had promised to fund into this health care uh, program. And that's, that was a lot of money and beyond, uh, beyond their means. And they had not, at the time we showed up, been able to fund it. They simply did not have the cash to actually fund it. Now, when you put all that together, not surprisingly, you can see that their profits were going down. And while there were some ups and downs, if you, if, you do a, if you draw a line through all these data points, you get that red line. And you can see that essentially this industry went from one that had made you know, quite good profits uh, and, and had been hugely successful to an industry that was consistently losing money uh, and really needed car sales to be above 16 million or so to make even a small profit. And that 16 million number, if you remember from one of the earlier slides, was a very uh, uh, ambitious number, one that we had only reached a few times in our history. So what did we do? We essentially approached this as a private equity assignment. Uh, my career had been heavily in private equity before that. I think the private equity discipline of focusing on costs, on capital allocation, on return on investment is a great discipline for every company, whether it's a private equity company or not. And so we took a private equity approach. And what, what does that involve? Well, first of all, it involved intensive due diligence. We went in and studied these companies and studied the industry top to bottom. As I said, I really actually did not know almost anything about cars. In fact, I live in Manhattan. I don't even drive very much. But, um, and my colleagues knew a little bit more about cars, but none of us were really car experts. But we were, we were private equity guys. We were people who were used to looking at a company or at an industry and tearing it apart and figuring out what made it work, or if it didn't work, coming to that conclusion, and then uh, coming up with an investable case. We viewed ourselves as, in, as investing taxpayer dollars. We were basically, our job was to see whether it was a business model for these companies that we could put billions of taxpayer, and we knew it was going to be billions, of taxpayer dollars into and have it be viable again. So we had to, in effect, create a business plan or a business model for these companies that worked. Uh, it couldn't anymore be a case where they only made a little bit of money in a great year and the rest of the time they kind of broke even or lost some money. We had to get them to a point where they consistently made money. So we, what did we focus on? We focused on, on management in part. Uh, I believe that management is a critical ingredient in the success of any business. There are certainly various structural issues in industries and franchises and industries and ways in which some industri industries succeed and others don't and some companies succeed. But I've been struck in, thir in 30 years in the business world, I have been struck by the difference that management can make in, the, in a company's success or failure. And it was very clear to me that part of the reason for the failure of these companies was management and also the boards that essentially allowed management to proceed they were, the way they were proceeding, allowed these companies to proceed the way they were going to proceed. I'll just give you one little vignette that, uh, that just captures a very small piece of this. But these companies were also in denial. They didn't even realize how bad their problems were. And it wasn't until October of 2008 that literally the GM management team showed up in Washington in Hank Paulson's office, then the Secretary of the Treasury, and said, we're going to run out of money probably in a month. And unless the government does something, we're going to have to close our doors and liquidate. Well, how do you run a business when you don't even know until a month before that you're essentially out of money and you're going to have to close your doors and liquidate? 
Uh, it was really the most extraordinary thing I had ever seen. GM's um, financial controls were so poor that they did not know on any given day within $500 million how much cash they had. And so as a result of that, they had to run with about $11 billion of working capital, which was probably twice, almost twice, what a company even of their size needed to operate. And that was obviously an incredibly inefficient and expensive way to run a railroad. So we saw management practices that I had never before seen in my life. And I was really shocked. You know, GM is GM, and it's a company that we all had been in awe of. And to get in there and see how badly run it was was really quite remarkable. Um, they also had uh, problems with their capital structure. They had a lot of these uh, legacy obligations to the unions that I talked about. They had these contracts that we talked about. They had too many, too many plants and, uh, and facilities for the size of the industry that was likely to be going forward. And they really had not done much about their cost structure, and they had not really done anything about their capital structure, their debt burden. And so we basically attacked all this and came up with a plan um, that we thought could work. As I said, that we thought that uh, one of the biggest problems was their culture. They had this thing that we, we called the GM way, where it was sort of, we're GM and we know how to do this, and we're not really all that interested in sort of outside points of view. There was no real, as I said, sense of urgency or a feeling that they had to take uh, major steps in order to avoid ending up in this position where they were essentially uh, almost bankrupt. And they had kind of come to accept this idea that they were just going to continue to lose market share and that uh, a lot of this was out of their control. You know, uh, Rick Wagner, when he showed up in front of Congress in the fall of 2008, basically blamed all of GM's problems on the credit crisis, on the unions, on fuel prices, and, you know, and on the exchange rate with the yen, and essentially took no responsibility at all um, for, for the state of the company. And we saw this over and over again, that it was just a culture of so to get along and go along, and nobody really willing to make decisions, and nobody really willing to buck the system and say, it's simply not working this way. We've got to start to do this uh, in a different way. So what did we do?